There we go. There we go. Okay, my bio there. Uh, I've written a number of books. In fact, this is just a half of the books I've written, but I've written a number of house books, and that's one reason why I'm doing this today, is most of the houses that you'll see here I've been in. In fact, hopefully most of these I've been in. Uh, I do have several books uh, still uh, available. Most of my books have sold out. People ask me why don't I reprint my books. Well, you need to buy my books, and then I'll, and I don't reprint my books. I, I just find as an author, you sell out your books and you go on to your next book. And that's sort of what I do. So several of my books here, some more. I already mentioned about the Louisville Historical League. Our dues are extremely, re we've not raised them in over 20 years, our dues. <laughs> and we don't plan on raising them anymore. Some of our recent events, we get out and actually see the history of Louisville. We don't sit in a classroom, we like to go out and see where it actually happened. Like we'll be at Locust Grove here uh, in April, and uh, we were at the Peterson Dumino House, we were in Germantown, we're all over the place doing things. Or again, about the young adults, uh, 30 and under, we have a QR code that you can find out more about the league. I want to thank the Louisville Library for allowing me to give a talk today. I love doing it at this location, very beautiful facility. And it does say 2.30. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, St. Matthew's Noble Houses. So some of the reference materials I'll be using is this one here, the Historic Jefferson County booklet. This was back when Jefferson County government actually had archivists on staff, historians on staff. They actually did great things like this book. I'm sure the library probably has it here in their collection, but it's a really good source for historic homes. Of course, uh, Saint, the great Sam Thomas, and his books, uh, and this one that he did here. Here are some of the books that Sam Thomas did. Just phenomenal. I mean, I'll, I'll never be able to compete with this. Sam was just, just phenomenal in, with his uh, research and history. He was a chemical engineer by nature, and so his brain was just wired for this sort of thing. Just phenomenal what he did. So anyways, we're going to be talking about St. Matthew's, which is about right in this location here. That star is where we're located at. You see Shelbyville Road, Breckenridge Lane. So we're going to be talking pretty much in this general vicinity here, these homes. Uh, one of the great uh, resources that we have is called the Bergman Map, 1858. Um, uh, Mr. Bergman, I think it was Samuel Ber Bergman. I'm trying to see what his first name was. But anyways... What a great job he had. He traveled the entire county and his staff, I'm sure he had other people, but they plotted where various houses and locations were in 1858. So we as historians are constantly referring to this map, as you'll see here soon, of where things were at uh, 100 and what, 65 years ago, if I'm doing my math right. And if you would like to find it, go to the Library of Congress website put in 1858 Louisville on the search engine here. It will pop up, and you can click on that. It's an interactive map. You can zoom in and out. Great detail about Louisville. <coughs> just a wonderful resource. I'm just so glad whoever thought of doing this in 1858. Uh, I'm sure it had tax purposes associated with it. But uh, anyways, great resource. So here's, here's some detail from that map and some of the homes that we'll soon be discussing. Uh, and so uh, we want to start off with what's called the land grant map of Louisville, 1774. Uh, it was due to these surveyors here, John Floyd, James Douglas, Hancock Taylor, and Isaac Height, um, uh, along with uh, Thomas Bullitt, who did a survey in 1773. And uh, we use this map a lot as well as to where things were at. You'll see up there the Southall Carlton um, 6,000 acres, we'll be referencing that as well. But um, everyone knows who John Connolly was, right? No? no, no. We should have been called Connollyville and not Louisville. Mm -hmm. Reason why, I'll just give you a little tidbit here. Reason why would be uh, Connolly uh, owned pretty much that area. He, he got that land grant. However, he picked the wrong side in the American Revolution. When George Rogers Clark came here, Connolly was here, and then Clark goes, hey, which side are you on? 
he chose wrong, mm -hmm. and he had to go up back up to Canada, where I think he died in Montreal, but uh, Clark took over his land grant. Floyd Breckenridge Caldwell family. So let's start at the very beginning with John Floyd. Hopefully everyone's familiar with the Floyd Station, which is not too far away from where we sit right now, just down Breckenridge Lane. He had a fort there, which no longer exists. In fact, I don't even know if they can figure out where it actually was situated. But anyways, uh, John Floyd, uh, pretty famous, but he was only 28 years old when he died, but he left one heck of a legacy for his brief 28 years. Uh, he was a surveyor, and for whatever reason, Native Americans hated surveyors. Uh, and so uh, they killed John Floyd uh, when he was trying to survey their land. He was talking about it. He was actually killed uh, off uh, Preston Highway and Snyder Freeway, if you know where that's at. He was over there surveying, and the Native Americans didn't quite take, take it too well that he was trying to take their land with this survey. So, uh, Floyd Breckenridge Cemetery, so if you see where the uh, yellow star is up there, that's where we're at currently. This is where Floyd's uh, station once was located, here next to uh, uh, I-64 in Breckenridge Lane area. This is the Floyd Cemetery, Floyd Breckenridge Cemetery. Where is it? It is right here. Do you know where um, I know those, um, what, what is it, those apartments there, Jamestown Apartments? It's oh. behind there. It's behind Jamestown's apartments. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about it shortly. So there, there's his grave site. And this was the legacy of John Floyd. I did a little gene genealogy chart here, kind of showing how, how it all turns into where we live at today. Uh, so Floyd died in an Indian attack on April the 8th. Golly, it's coming up on what? Uh, 200 and what? Time to do the math here. 40 years, 240 years ago, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That he died? Is that math correct? Wow. Okay. And so who inherited his land? You can see where the name Breckenridge comes from. Uh, his wife marries a Breckenridge. And then uh, they have three sons. One's called James Douglas Breckenridge, married various folks. You can just kind of follow the, uh, the lineage here. Uh, the Speed Art Museum is connected. Uh, uh, James Breckenridge Speed is connected to, the, um, to John Floyd. Um, all, the, all the things that you see here. And so, where was all the Floyd land at? So here is the Floyd house, really the Breckenridge house, uh, Floyd's house, log house, whatever it was, no longer exists. But what did exist was the Breckenridge Caldwell house, right at this point here. This is uh, Bardstown Road right here. Uh, this is now called Pee Wee Reese Lane. Um, the uh, Seneca Golf Course is up in this area here, if you're all familiar with that. So here is, there's where we're at there in the Gold Star. Way over here is where the, the Breckenridge Caldwell house is. Even though Breckenridge Lane is way over here, uh, John Floyd owned all this land. He owned a thousand or so acres, even more, maybe 2,000 acres in this area here. And uh, their house was way over here, the, the Breckenridge Caldwell house. Uh, John Floyd lived in this general area. So there's the house itself. There's some more, uh, more recent photographs. And so now you can kind of see where this house once was. There's Pee Wee Reese Road or Drive or whatever it is there. You got Bowman Field up here. Um, Seneca Golf Course is just down the road there. In fact, there's the clubhouse right there. So you can kind of get a feeling, and you can see where the house once was. It no longer exists there. In fact, it's at the driving range. If anyone knows where the driving range for Seneca Golf Course is, that's where the house once stood. There was a photograph in 1911 of the house. And there are still remnants there, from what I understand. People go back into all the, the weeds and the 
scrub that's there, and uh, they they have found certain remnants of that house that uh, that still exist. Um, the Breckenridges, Caldwells owned a lot of property, um, not only in the St. Matthews area, but also in the Shelby Park area of Louisville. And they left a big legacy as well with all sorts of things. So the uh, Caldwell sisters, the famous monument there at Cave Hill Cemetery, uh, where the both sisters are now uh, buried, uh, they donated a lot of money to Catholic University. That's Caldwell Hall there in Washington, D.C. Uh, of course, St. Mary and Elizabeth uh, Hospital there in the South End. So uh, the Floyds, Caldwells, or Floyd, Breckenridge Caldwells had a tremendous legacy in this area, and it still remains. And, of course, one of their biggest uh, remnants is the name of Breckenridge Lane and how it got its name. As you can see, it used, used to be called With an Eye, but back in the early 1960s, for whatever reason, some government person thought it would be best to eliminate the confusion between Breckenridge Street in downtown Louisville and Breckenridge Lane out here in St. Matthews, so they decided to put an E in it. And so that's how Breckenridge, Lane, Street, whatever, came to be. Any questions on that? <laughs> but yeah, someone downtown decided, well, let's eliminate the confusing confusion and put an E, and that's how that all happens. Okay, Alexander Scott and Priscilla Christian Bullet, Oxmoor, built the house in 1791, some major renovation and expansion in 1829. So, uh, everyone's familiar with Oxmoor, of course. Uh, there is the mall up there, the Waterson Expressway, Shelbyville Road, and the house is right here. Everyone hopefully has been to the house or seen the house. And, uh, the Filson Historical Society just had a huge event there last, what was it, last Thursday, I think. Hopefully you get a chance to see it. They open it up periodically. In fact, if you're driving along here and the gates are open, drive back in there and look at that, look it over. It's owned by the Filson, and you can go back in there if the gates are open, or usually have the gates closed. Anyways, so here's Oxmoor. Gosh, it's filled with an E there, and just one O, or two O's, but usually it's three O's. <coughs> Anyways. And Sam Thomas did this wonderful book on it. If you're really intrigued by Oxmoor, um, get the book. I'm sure it's here in the library to check out. So, trying to figure out the genealogy of all of this, a number of years ago I put together this chart here to kind of figure out who's who and all. There used to be on, on the internet this wonderful book, and thank goodness I printed it out before they, they took it off the internet. I'm not sure where, where it went, or I can't find it anymore. But it was called Louisville's First Families. And someone had done a genealogy of all the various folks, Bullets, the Praethors, the Clarks, the Churchills, you name it, they're all here, the Speeds. And, but it's all written out, it's all in text form, and so I did actual genealogy charts to kind of piece together who's who and where they all went to. Because as you'll find out, as you'll see here later in my presentation, I'll be using this chart throughout to kind of give an explanation of how all these houses were connected. We see Thomas Bullitt, again, he was a surveyor that I mentioned early on about the land grants, and then his son, Alexander Scott Bullitt, and he, he had two wives, I'll explain that here shortly, and then more of his kids. <coughs> Priscilla, notice it says niece to Patrick Henry. Interesting clue there. So there's Oxmoor, hopefully again everyone's been out there and seen all this. This is out of my uh, Historic Houses of Louisville book. It's just spectacular. Here's the huge library there, the largest private library in Kentucky. Just kind of click through some of these. So, Oxmoor and Bullitt family. So now then we have the Christian Altaburn family. By the way, I'm kind of connect, kind of going a little fast, but you'll see these are all connected as I start piecing this together. So the Christian Altaburn 
family. They are located here. Uh, there is Oxmoor Farm. There is the, the Oxmoor House, Bull of the State. The, uh, the red dot up there is the uh, Christian Altaburg House. It's right near Coe's Department Store, if you're familiar with that, over there uh, next to Oxmoor. Yeah. Yeah. Try and give you some visual references today as to where all this exists. And there's the house. Has, has everyone seen this house here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's here. So that's the William and Ann Christian log house. It still exists. So who is William Christian? As you can tell there, he's a pioneer leader from Virginia, uh, French and Indian War, brought his family to Kentucky in 1785, did various other things. Um, and you will see up over here, his wife Anne was a sister to Patrick Henry. So that's another good clue and connection. So, William and Anne Christian had a daughter named Priscilla who married Alexander Scott Bullitt. So there's, there's a connection there. So that's the reason why the Christian house and the Bullitt house are adjacent to each other. They're neighbors because of uh, the marriage connection there. And Priscilla was only 15 years old when she married uh, Alexander. How old was he? Uh, that I do not know. It's probably in some of my genealogy information here, but yeah, I think he was a, scene, a little bit older than uh, Priscilla. In fact, there it is up there, 1762 uh, is when he was born. They, get, they built the house, that they were married in 90, uh, 1790, so she would subtract 15 years from that, is what? 1785, would that be right if I'm doing my math? So a little bit older than, than that, yep. I had that correct. So um, then uh, William Christian, and I'm not sure if I noted it there, but he was also killed by Native Americans. He was out on his farm one day and didn't survive a, an Indian attack. So he didn't live very long and Soon thereafter, in 1830, the Alterburn family purchased the log house. So uh, the log house was built in 1785-86 period, and then uh, the Alterburns bought it in 1830. There's about a little bit of a history of it, about how they used to go about doing things. So uh, this is a, a 1878 map of the area. So again, they purchased it in 1830, but they already called the Alderburn um, residence. Some history of it there. So will give you a little bit more uh, context here. So we have Shelbyville Road going all the way across here, the Alderburn house here, the Bullet House in Oxmoor over here. Give you a connection there. So and the Oxmoor Mall sits right here nowadays. And then down the, across the street, across Shelbyville, William Crawford Alderburn, who was a uh, son of Rachel's, uh, owned all that land over there. And then Covington Alderburn owned here. So um, the uh, uh, St. Matthew's Mall sits in this general vicinity here nowadays. The Alderburn house, who pays for the upkeep of it now? Uh, I think it's uh, privately owned now. It's still owned privately. The Oliver House, yeah. It's still not, it's not a public structure or anything. It's still someone who lives there. At least every time I go by to take a picture there, there's cars in the parking lot <laughs> or in the driveway. Uh, and so uh, William Crawford Alderburn, this was his house. It was over again on the, uh, the uh, east side of Shelbyville Road which is pointed to right there. So this house here existed right there. I'm not exactly certain what is at that location nowadays. It's all retail, probably 
a Planet Fitness or something like that exist at that location now. And what's also very interesting is the family cemetery is still ex in existence right here. Of course, the uh, Bullet Cemetery is up over here, which is still there. But the uh, Oliver Family Cemetery is over there. There it is. Some of the headstones and those that are buried there. So they had nine boys. Here are their names. How do we remember the Audubons in today's history? There are some of the references, some of the street names named for them. The house still exists and is, is occupied, as you can tell by the furniture on the porch. And one of the infamous sides of the Audubon family is two of their sons were major slave traders. And this is a uh, historic marker in downtown Louisville, Jordan and Tarleton Alderburn. And this is the Alderburn family. They had a reunion there just, what, 11 years ago in front of their home so homestead. So the Christian family really only lived here about one, one or two years. They weren't there that long. But the Alderburns owned it for most of its existence. To my knowledge, they know who own it today. By the way, I know one of the Alderburn family, and I've tried to reach out to him, sending several emails and all, and he never replied because I would have liked to have found out a little bit more on the house. Maybe he will eventually, but uh, anyways, I'm sure he was, he was in that photograph. So Springfield, Richard Taylor's house on Apache Road. They call it the Zachary Taylor house. But Zachary, as most of you know, was pretty much in the military most of his life and really did not live here. Now, his wife lived here a lot, but, uh, and most of his children were born here, but uh, I just call it the Teller House. <clears throat> so here we are here. There's where we're currently at there, I believe. And then the house is farther up there off Brownsboro Road near the Waterson Expressway. Hopefully everyone's been by this house. It's one of the few presidential houses that is still in private hands. Me and my wife were just at a recent presidential house, still in private hands. Who would that have been? Carter. Jimmy Carter. Correct. Jimmy Carter's house is still in private hands. He, he was there. We were there a week before they announced that he was in hospice care. So anyways, the Zachary Taylor house. Now, I've seen it spelled several ways, Springfield and Springfields. As you can see up there, Bergman put an S on it, but most of the time I see it without the S. And the reason why it's called Springfield is, as, as the name suggests, there were springs in the field. Pretty logical why they named it. It's just beautiful in the interior. This is a Dr. Gist. I think he still owns it. He's a dentist, but I think he still owns the house. That photograph was taken about 14 or so years ago. And old Zach there, of course, there's his mausoleum. Some uh, information about the house. Um, this was the original part of the house here. Then they added on that section. There was a fire in the 1880s, and that's why they painted it white. And you can kind of just see some of the history of it there. And of course, the 1974 tornado did not do it very well. The uh, Courier Journal editorial cartoonist Hugh Haney owned the house from 73 to 81. You all remember Hugh Haney. Fortunately, he had it restored. And Dinwiddie Lampton owned the house from 1941 to 1955. Be wise, be insured, right? <laughs> Some more photographs. They installed these gates. They used to not have gates there. You used to be able to just drive <coughs> up into it. But uh, I think a lot of people like to go by and knock on the door, so they put up some gates. Okay, Locust Grove, William and Lucy Cron. If I can get that pronunciated correctly, Cron, just like Cron, as they say. 
So here we are with the red star, and Locust Grove is to the north of us there. Here you can see Locust Grove on the 1858 map. <coughs> and the house itself. Everyone here has been to Locust Grove, right? If not, <laughs> get there. And like I said, you go there for free on April the 23rd with the Louisville Historical League. Some images of it. Just phenomenal. Of course, if you know the history of this house, I probably should include some of those photos. But in the early 1960s, this house was about ready to fall over. About, it was so deteriorated. It, if it wasn't for the work of Sam Thomas and his brother and several other preservationists, this house probably would have been uh, destroyed or demoed. But they brought it back in the 1970s and 80s and looks good as new. Ridgeway. Why did they change? What's that? Yeah, go ahead. Why did, when they redecorated 30, 40 years ago, they brought it up to the styles of the 1820s rather than the 1790s? Why? I'll let them decide and make those decisions. <laughs> I don't get involved in that. I, I agree with you. Mistake. Same thing at Farmington. What they did at Farmington, you go in there, it's like, whoa. Yeah. What's, what's this about? Yeah. Yeah, I agree and with you. If Farmington can represent the 1820s, we should have stayed with them. But yeah, these, uh, but they use uh, period historians to do that, so I trust their judgment. Well, that's what they did. The Let them do what they want to do. Historians. Ridgeway, I mm -hmm. uh, note the name Bullet again, Henry Massey. There's a uh, historical photograph of uh, Ridgeway up above and what it looks like today. And there it is on the 1858 map. Again, the yellow star is where we're at and where Ridgeway is located. You really can't see it from Massey Avenue too well. At least I can't when I drive by it. It's kind of set back off the road. And I don't know if it has gates on it or not. I'm trying to remember. I can't think of it has gates. You can probably drive up in there if you want to, but nowadays I would not suggest just driving up in the lot in the driveway as much. Oxmoor you can. That's a public estate, but uh, private estates I would kind of tend to shy away from doing that. So here is my uh, genealogy chart, chart again, and wait a minute. There we go. So um, Henry Massey married Helen, who was a uh, child of Mary Churchill Prather and Scott Bullitt. By the way, uh, Mary Churchill Prather, she was connected to uh, Sam Churchill of Kentucky Derby fame, Churchill Downs fame, and all that. Here's talking more about the house and the architecture. It's called one of Kentucky's finest examples of federal domestic architecture. Very stately home. I'm so glad they brought it back and uh, revived it the way they did. Beautiful, beautiful house. Alexander and Olivia Beach Indian Hill Stock Farm. So there's the uh, where we're at, where we're going up there in the upper left hand corner. There it is on the 1858 map, the beach farm. Right there, a neighbor, obviously, to the Taylor family. <clears throat> so here is a, uh, this is from that uh, historic uh, house book that the county put out a number of years ago, talking about how it was built uh, early 1830s, then uh, 1860s, a major addition was put onto the rear of the house. It was damaged in the 74 tornado. A little history of the house and some people that live there talking about it. I don't talk too much about the potato history of St. Matthews, but there you go. They grew a lot of potatoes on this farm. I think the house still exists. Correct me if I'm wrong, those of you that live in Indian Hills. I believe the house still is there. 
No one knows that. I believe it's still there. Should have went by and took a better photograph of it. The John Lewis and the Exley's house. There's a, where it would be located. So we have a Shelbyville Road going along here, Breckenridge Lane there, Westport Road up there. The Red Star is where it's at. There we are down here, just directly to the north of us here. That's the house. It was in pretty bad shape, what, about 15 or so years ago? And a business, I think, purchased it and really did a ph phenomenal. We all thought they were going to demolish it, but they uh, brought it back. It's a beautiful house. I think it's a business now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a business there now. And there's the Exleys uh, sitting out front in 1895. More bullets and Chinowiths. So there's the Chinowith homestead. You can actually see it from Chinowith Lane as you drive by. Um, and again, um, Dr. Chinowith, Henry Chinowith, married Helen Bullitt, who was the daughter of William Bullitt. So there's the genealogy of all that. Now this was phenomenal. I had no idea this was. I've always heard about this in Louisville history, but didn't know much. I just heard about it, and y'all may be the same way. But there was some sort of a major issue here, um, uh, illness. It was it was a part of a wedding, the Her family. Um, there was a wedding with the Her family, and most of the people that attended that wedding got very seriously ill. I think the groom died. Um, there's a lot of problems with it, with this wedding. And so Dr. Henry and James Chenoweth decided, hey, let's go out there and find out what went on. So here's the tell on April 15, 1891. They, uh, Fanny and Willie Winfried were wed at the family's farm near Linden Station, Kentucky, which actually is just here in St. Matthews for the most part and talking about the her mansion and 80 people ate all sorts of food and 70 people fell ill and um, uh, the, the groom I think died, yeah the groom died, the bride did live, but uh, it was a massive uh, poisoning uh, uh, thing at this wedding and U of L did a study of it, what, what was the cause, they thought there was a chicken salad sitting down in the sun too much. But uh, very significant thing. I had no idea until I did this research. So where is that house at today? So there is um, uh, Dr. Chinowith's house there off of Chinowith Lane. And then the house, uh, the Hare Mansion, is right over here off Hare Lane, just past the Waterson Expressway. So it's still there. So that's the infamous episode back in 1891. Who knew? Did anyone know anything about that? Yes. I mean, okay, I anyone else? Anywhere. Yeah, hardly anyone know. I, I hear about it, talked about periodically, but... I, I live around the corner from that. House. Oh, wow. And um, a while back, someone was telling me the story. They read about it online, and they found uh, a map of the estate of Oh, wow. Yeah, it's really cool. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I scan it and put it online. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, fascinating little history that who knew? But uh, Dr. Henry Chenoweth was part of all that. Okay, James Brown, and not the singer. But uh, <laughs> anyways, there's uh, the yellow star where we're at. And then we're going to be talking about the house, which is over here. Off of, uh, well, there's Hubbard's Lane. I think it changes what the Browns Lane. All this gets very confusing if all these streets change their names. But uh, we'll be talking about it right there. So the Brown family owned all of that from uh, Shelbyville Road all the way down to pretty much where here's Tellersville Road down here. So you can just see how much land they owned at one point, the Browns. 
There's James Brown's house, which is now the clubhouse of Mallard Crossing Apartments or condos or whatever residential community it is. They put a very nice plaque up there on, on the building talking about it. By the way, here it talks about their connection to the Lawrence family, and we'll reference the Lawrence family here shortly. The Monaghan family also owned it for a period of time. And so their cemetery, which a lot of you see off Browns Lane, it's right here adjacent to uh, uh, I-64. Uh, so the house is right there at Mallard Crossing. And um, it's the Brown Lawrence Cemetery. Here are some of the photographs of it. Let's talk one more Brown, Theodore Brown. You know that as Woodhaven Bed and Breakfast. Hopefully everyone has seen this as you drive along. I think this is on Hubbard's Lane. And the Theodore Brown estate was right there. So we are at the Yellow Star, and then the uh, Woodhaven Bed and Breakfast is over here. So it's pretty much to the, uh, to, uh, what, to the east of us. There's a historic photograph of it. So now then, as, as the house is designed, it's a carpenter gothic. So the question is, well, who was the architect for this? Well, back in rural times, back in the 1800s, they had pattern books that um, various designers like Andrew Jackson Downing here did. And Andrew Jackson Downing just sketched up various nice designs of homes, put them in a book, and it was distributed throughout the United States. And usually as you're driving around uh, rural areas, you'll see these houses that people, you know, the, the farmers and the merchants back in the day, they'll get the pattern book and just go to the local contractor and say, hey, can you build this? And voila, that's how these usually happen. Everyone know who Andrew Jackson Downing is, right? No. Oh, no. Well, you would know if he had survived. He was only, what, 37 years old when he drowned in a boating accident. Uh, but you would know who his partner is, Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh -huh. if, if he had lived, he would have been, he actually did the concept for Central Park. Central Park was his baby. And when he drowned, his partner, mm -hmm. Frederick Law Olmsted, if you ever want to read a really good biography, read one of Frederick Law Olmsted. He was the uh, Forrest Gump of his day. He was always there at the right place, the right time, and um, he picked up, and the rest is history, as they say. Here are some other, uh, so there's the, uh, the Brown House, <laughs> Woodhaven Bed and Breakfast. Another one of Downing's sort of designs was Linford, which is out there in the Her Hurstburn Country Club. Similar designs. James V. Prather, I'm not sure if y'all that name strikes a bell with you folks, but uh, here's some of the history of that house. The house used to exist here, which we now know as Brown Park, but Prather's house was in this general area, obviously has since been uh, demolished. But if you see up there in the, uh, the text, you'll see the name James Prather and John Jacob. They were the sons of two very well-known merchants here in Louisville. Um, Prather family and the Jacobs. Here is some of their information. So Thomas Prather, very well-known merchant, and then his partner was John Jacob. Uh, Broadway used to be known as Prather back in the day. It was Prather, then Dunkirk, then uh, Broadway. So he was a pretty well-known merchant back in the day. But they, his son owned a uh, house there at Brown Park. And then James Graham Brown then owned that area. And they were not connected. A lot of people think that those Browns and these, there's a lot of Browns out there. In fact, the other, I was emailing with someone the other day asking about a certain Brown. I said, no, it's not that Brown. It's this Brown. Um, but James Graham Brown actually was from Indiana, Madison, Indiana. But anyway, he's, he did own this land as well. He purchased that, had a farm there, stabled his horses there. Of 
course, built Brown Hotel. Floyd Parks. Whenever I see that, I think the Parklands of Floyd's Fork. <laughs> but uh, he actually was a person. Floyd Parks. And there, as the 1858 map of Louisville, with Shelbyville Road up there. Um, here is, uh, I think this is Breckenridge Lane over here. If I got right, Cannon, Cannon's Lane came through here. Hubbard's Lane came through here. I've got a little map here shortly that brings all this together. But anyways, nothing is left of the Floyd's Parks house. I could not find any image or anything of what they once owned. It's all been them. But there are cemeteries still exist. And it's over there very near the Breckenridge of Floyd Cemetery behind the Jamestown Apartments. It's a small little cemetery that still exists over there off of Prince William Street there. Uh, the Burks home, very famous house. So the Burks owned a lot of land in this area as well. Again, the 1858 map. I'm pretty much going throughout the entire 1858 map, showing you where everyone once lived. And so uh, the John Burks folks, some of you may have seen this house here. It's kind of hidden back uh, off of Breckenridge Lane. Even though it has a Breckenridge Lane address, 615, you cannot see it from Breckenridge Lane. So here it is here. There's some condominiums that were built out in front of it here off Breckenridge Lane. There's where we're at here. And so you have to drive down Winchester Road and then come in this direction to get to it. There's uh, various folks have owned this house over the years. Kind of an Italianate style. It's got bracketed eaves. The windows are somewhat Italianate, but uh, I, I would say it's more Italianate than anything else. And in fact, it says Italianate up there, doesn't it? There's also what's called Kentwood. I've never heard it, other than this, uh, this was a Kaiser uh, sketch of the house. I've never heard it called Kentwood other than this one uh, thing that Kaiser did. So talking about that Burks, how he came here as a farmer, farmer, pretty wealthy. Uh, there's the uh, mailbox. I, I had no idea who owned this house currently. And then I saw Sawyer Nolan. I said, I know Sawyer and Nolans. <laughs> and then the Breckenridge Lane address there, 615. And hopefully you all know who Tom Nolan was. Tom passed away, what, about two or so years ago? Very sad. Uh, but Vivian is still with us, and she's one of my Facebook friends. And uh, I'm not sure Vivian, I don't see her here today. I told her I was doing this today, but uh, Vivian still owns the house. And unfortunately, had a very uh, bad episode there just within the last year. They had a massive fire at this house. Oh yeah, she, was, she had just come back from a trip, and she was sleeping upstairs and smelled smoke. Smoke alarms going off. What's going on? Whole kit and the fire department was St. Matthew's fire department was there fairly quickly. But uh, wow. And I think it's pretty much restored now. I was she invited me over but uh, I wasn't able to make it by. But anyways, I think she says that she's got it back restored now. So uh, the Burks family, there you see where they're at up off of Winchester Road where the house is, but their cemetery is in a very public location right here in the parking lot of Home Depot. Yeah. You may have driven around that cemetery. There it is, Bed Bath & Beyond. Really of the beyond nature here. <laughs> but uh, anyways, talking about it here. And the Gold Maxim Farm, I wasn't too familiar with that, but this used to be all farmland uh, prior to the uh, Lincoln Income Life Building being built and Canaan Tower and all that. But um, anyways, number of the Burks families here, there's a small child buried at this location here. And it's really unfortunate that it's wide open. The gates, anyone can go in there. It really, I wish it would be more protected. They should really have nice gates up around this thing. Norburn Bill and Spring Station. 
So Spring Station is right there. We have uh, uh, Shelbyville Road, uh, Frankfurt Avenue up above, and Lexington Road cutting through here. I think this is Cannons Lane, I think, coming up through there. Breckenridge Lane is over here. So we are over here, and Spring Station is way over there off Trinity Road and uh, Cannons Lane. You really cannot see this house anywhere. I, I've been by it several times. It's set so far back off Trinity Road. They've got gates up. Uh, I've never personally seen it in real life, but that's what it looks like. It's phenomenal. It has a hallway. You go through the doors, and there's this hallway. That so you've been in it, huh? Yeah, <laughs> okay. years ago. That's what I remember. Is the yeah, no, it's a, it's, wow. it's a fantastic home. And you can just see when they think it was built in, in between this era, possibly 1802. Beals Branch Road, as you drive through there, there's where it gets its name and all. Gosh, he almost had 3,000 acres of land. Hmm, connected to Thomas Jefferson. I wonder how he got all that land. That's one of the interesting things. Connected to Patrick Henry. Hmm, how did they get thousands of acres of land? I wonder. <laughs> These land grants. Of course, we have to talk about Thomas Cannon. We drive down his, his road every day for the most part around here. So here I connect everything on this 1858 map with all the streets and where Thomas Cannon's farm once was. Let y'all take a moment to kind of figure it all out. But uh, by the way, Hubbard's, Hubbard's house was north of Shelbyville Road, and I don't have any, I don't even think it exists. I've never seen images of it, but he's got a great road named after him. You know, everyone else, I think we pretty much uh, have figured out who, how the names came about. Stratton Hammond, some of y'all may be familiar with him, he's a famous architect. A nice book put out by uh, Blackburn and Gill a few years ago about all of his beautiful houses that he designed over time. I'm sure the library has it here if you want to check it out. But he won a, a home design contest in, what, 1929, 1930 era. He uh, did this sketch of this house and he won the uh, home design contest. And they actually built the house down at the, the armory. We now call it Louisville Gardens, but the realtors, the home builders built the, the, the house that he designed. That's there, the 1930 competition house. And they built it in real life. Here's where it exists. 4004 Norburn Boulevard. And as we've already talked about, Norburn was a altar burn. So, yeah. So where is that house? It's right off Breckenridge Lane, Norburn Boulevard. You can go drive by it today if you want, 4004 Norburn. And there we are. It's not very far, just about three blocks away from us here. Stratton Hammond, he always liked to identify his houses. He put little plaques on them. Very Frank Lloyd Wright-ish of him to do that. But, uh, Anyways, that's his house up there in the upper left-hand corner. Lustrin Homes, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with Lustrins, but they were more uh, mid-century homes. Here are two of these. This one's on Westport Drive, not right by the Target. And uh, that's it there. These were prefabricated homes. They built them in the factory and they brought them uh, in by truck and they installed them. There's about 18 to 20 lustrins here in Louisville. One of the really nice ones was over here off Hubbard's Lane. It still exists, but if you know any history of this house, a big tree fell on it during a storm and just crushed it. And so they had to put up a vinyl siding along the exterior after that. Really a shame because it was just a beautiful lustrum. Were they made of a particular material? Yeah, they were aluminum on the exterior and uh, oh, they're just phenomenal. Unfortunately, people don't value them very much, and periodically, one will get demoed here. But uh, yeah, there's a number of lustrins, and they're in my Modern Houses of Louisville book. I have where they're all located, uh, categorized them. 
Norman Sweet, he was a great St. Matthew's resident. He was an architect. I, uh, I keep a, um, a massive database. I have over 3,000 buildings on an Excel spreadsheet. That's, it's on the library website here. It's at the Filson. It's at U of L. But I document where all these homes are located. And this is for Norm Sweet, all of the homes that he uh, helped design, where, where they're located. Some of the homes that he designed. Ooh. Very mid-century modern homes. Again, very Frank Lloyd Wright-ish, if you will. He was a uh, contemporary of Frank Lloyd Wright. And here are the ones that are in the um, St. Matthews area. Hillside Lane, which is just off of Hubbard's Lane. Westport Drive, he did a little addition off back one of the homes there. And he lived here in St. Matthews as well on Ormond Road, built his own house in 1950 there. As you notice, I have it as black and white. You want to see what's there now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. When I found out Norm Sweet, oh, let's go see where Norm Sweet lived, huh? Me and my architect friend, we drove over there, and our chin just dropped when we got to the address. We could not believe that they tore his house down and built this. Hopefully no one lives there that y'all know. <laughs> but yeah, uh, his house would have been more famous than that. But yeah, it's really sad that they demolished Norm Sweet's home. Norm Sweet uh, designed this. The old, uh, what was this, Criers, Criers restaurant. Which, of course, this sits there now at Hubbard's Lane and Shelbyville Road. And, of course, I need to talk about the Eli House, because this is St. Matthew's Eli's uh, Library, correct, Eric? So let's talk about the Eli House. We'll finish up on this one. So there's the house itself. And it was located on uh, Shelbyville Road at Fairfax Avenue. I don't have, I do not know what exists there today. I don't think the house is long gone. But this was a fascinating photograph. They have a horse out front and various other people photographed there. But uh, yeah, they were in the real estate, owned a lot of real estate, owned a lot of property here in the St. Matthews area. And uh, that's their home. <coughs> Now think what, Eric, they donated money for this library. I think that's why it's called the Eli Library, correct? Uh, the older branch, I mean, in its original form, yes. This particular branch. It's no longer called the Eli Branch? Yeah. Okay, well, I still call it the Eli. Does everyone still call it the Eli <coughs> Library? Call it the Eli. You, you can rename it, Eric, but we're still, we're, we're, all of us Louisvillians, we still reference things by what used to exist there before. <laughs> Everyone, I always say, well, you know where the old Sears was in St. Matthews? <laughs> Or the White Castle on Eastern Parkway, right? <laughs> you know, this is the Eli Branch as far as I know. front still says Eli. So. Oh, it does it? <laughs> <laughs> and this is a map, 1913 map of uh, uh, St. Matthews with every, all the farms and everything broken up. It's no longer the way it once was. So, can, so, you, go, uh, can you go back to that for just one Sure, question? sure, sure. Go ahead. That's okay. Thank yeah, you. And this is in San Thomas's book for what it's worth. Uh, St. Matthew's book, uh, that little, this one, wherever it's at. I got that out in this book here. So okay. if you want, need to reference that, look at it a little bit closer. Thank you. And so a little chronology of some of the houses that we've explored here today, talking uh, from Floyd Station all the way down to Dr. Chenoweth's house. Those are the more historic homes, sort of how they were all built and when they were built. And these are all the names of the houses that we went through today. We did a lot. We went over a lot of stuff. I am giving more talks. Uh, my next talk is on researching homes. It's going to be at the Highland uh, Library on April 13th. Uh, if you want to do your own house history, we'll explain to you how to go about doing that. Uh, on April 15th, which is a Saturday down at the uh, library, I'm going to be talking about the Olmstead uh, Parks and how they actually came about. A lot of people think that Frederick Law Olmstead just came here and waved his magic wand and they appeared. Well, there was a lot of work done before he got here, and we'll be going over that. And if you're interested in any books, see me afterwards. And thanks for attending. All right. Okay. Thank you.